Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Dan Moldovan, and today I will talk some. I will talk about some of the internals and functionality of uh, Autograph. Um, now, this is definitely not an introductory talk, and if you would like to learn more about the background or the motivation behind Autograph, here are a few uh, resources that I believe can help. Um, the talk will be otherwise fairly fast-paced, quite dense. I'm hoping we'll be able to get through all of it um, in time. But if not, I'm hoping the slides will be um, able to serve as a good reference should you decide to come back and uh, look at anything more closely. Um, I should caution, though, that I am oversimplifying a lot of things for the sake of brevity and time. Uh, but the essential things are in there. The talk will be structured in roughly in three parts. First, I'll talk some about uh, uh, some of the more Im uh, relevant implementation details, which are useful to understanding some of Autograph's behavior. Then I'll describe the various ways in which you, in which you in, uh, can interact with. And lastly, I'll go through various use cases that highlight what works, what doesn't work, common pitfalls, how to stay away from them, and what are our plans to eventually address them. So uh, let's begin with the, with the implementation. From a systems perspective, this is roughly what Autograph looks like. In broad strokes, we have the following, going from the bottom to the top. We have an infrastructure for performing source code transformations with various helpers. And on top of that, we have individual transformations. For instance, there is a, a separate transformation that handles function calls. Uh, another one handles break statements, and yet another transformation handles if statements. And these transformations are independent and composable. Many of these transformations then replace your code with calls to special autograph functions. We call them overloads or operators for the, re for the reason that they are very similar to uh, Python's uh, overloaded operators. Now, of those overloads, there are the most interesting ones, the ones that specialized on creating TensorFlow ops. And lastly, there's a high-level API that glues them all together. And this is typically what you usually interact with as a user. One last note that I should make is that uh, of all these pieces, only the TensorFlow specialized overloads and perhaps the high-level API, only these are specific to TensorFlow. Everything else are, is fairly generic and reusable, and we hope to eventually uh, um, have them in a separate library that uh, can be used for other purposes as well. All right. So one of the fundamental pieces of Autograph is, of course, the source code transformation bit. So let's look at that a bit more closely. Source code transformation is essentially what makes Autograph a transpiler. Its unit of work is functions. That is, at runtime, a function is being converted into a new function. So let's look more closely, about, uh, more closely at that process. It is roughly, loosely speaking, a five-step process. The, the first step is to obtain the source code of, of the function. Now, the standard Python library makes that easy for us. It provides the inspect module, which is built in, and it lets us do that. This also highlights one of the fundamental requirements of Autograph. In order to convert a function, that function must expose its source code. And that's typically true for almost all functions in Python, although there are certain uh, exceptions. Normally, you can test this uh, on your function by calling inspect get source. If inspect get source returns data, then Autograph should be fine with it. The second uh, step in this process is to parse the code into an AST. And once more, there is a standard Python API for this, uh, which is good. We, in fact, use a, a thin layer on top of that. It's a third-party library called GAST. It's practically identical to AST, but it handles all the version differences between uh, Python 2 and Python 3. It's worth mentioning at this point that Autograph operates entirely at AST level. There is no lower level intermediate representation, and we never interact with the bytecode. And that has um, some unique advantages. Now, the third step does the bulk of the work, and that's quite both literally and figuratively. The standard Python uh, library offers a mechanism that helps us with that as well. Um, the AST module provides a, a, a me mechanism for visiting and transforming ASTs. That mechanism uses the visitor pattern, and it's sketched here. Basically, you get some callbacks whenever the visitor uh, encounters uh, different types of nodes. 
And on top of that, we have built an entire library of uh, such transformations as we've seen in the, the, in the previous diagram. These transformations are called in sequence. Now, once transformed, the DST is unparsed back into source code in the form of a string. There isn't a standard uh, library for doing that, but thankfully there is a third party uh, library called Astor, which does a decent job, a job at that. Essentially, it's lots of string concatenations. There's nothing um, special about that. Finally, the source code is being output into a file and then loaded using a mechanism that's identical to writing an import statement. Once more, Python helps us with that with the standard module called imp. Um, the special thing about imp is that it only works with uh, files on disk, hence the need to generate a temporary file. I should also make a slight note that one other, another mechanism that we could have used would be exec. And we've, find, we've been going back and forth between using that and imp. There are pros and cons to using each. So we might revisit this um, in the future. All right, a few other mechanisms that are worth mentioning. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the templating system that we developed to help us with generating code. It essentially lets us write templates in the form of strings, code blocks of strings, and they support placeholders, and they let us generate more complex or new uh, ASTs. If you ever poke inside the transformations library, you will see plenty of such templates. Another important piece is the static analysis, which uh, is critical in supporting uh, certain transformations, and we'll see more about that in a bit. Uh, the analysis itself can be viewed as a, just a simple uh, walk over the AST, and it annotates nodes with relevant information. Another important mechanism is caching. Caching itself is completely transparent to the user, but it does help us make sure that every function is converted no more than once, loosely speaking. Uh, the, this cache relies on the key assumption that the conversion process is entirely static. That is, the generated code, what ends up in the generated code, does not depend on any arguments or variables or any other state of Python. Basically, if you look at some uh, plain code on paper, you would know exactly what the output code should be. Next, let's talk about uh, some of the actual transformations that are being made. And before I proceed, I should clarify that I'll use the word variable a lot. These are meant to mean Python variables, not to be confused with TensorFlow variables, which are not involved here. All right. One such transformation is uh, simplifying the code by replacing some uh, statements with other statements, simpler ones, um, such as, for instance, we replace break statements with variables and additional if statements. This essentially helps us um, avoid the need to, 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 to build uh, special um, handlers in TensorFlow for these statements, like break. They're just easier to uh, lower into something simpler. And um, the process is, yes. Does that imply that if I do like while, you know, n less than a million break, that mm -hmm. that's going to be very efficient when convert inefficient when converted? It will still loop over the maximal range? It will not loop over the maximum range because the while statement, as seen in this example, will have its condition augmented. So yes, the overhead is one, maybe two extra conditionals, not more than that. Um, yes? Uh, how do you guarantee the freshness of verbal names? We have uh, small modules, it's not mentioned here, a gensim. We look at the function's globals, its uh, closure, and those indeed depend on the, on the context variables. So if you take a function, you convert it, and you get a certain name, and then suppose you create some other function, and then you run the converted function, it might clash. That's very unlikely because if you change the code that we transformed, then the function will be reconverted, right? So there's, I'm not sure there's, it's even possible to get a clash. Well, you could get a clash in theory, but you would have to work very hard to, to do that. But yeah, that's, that's a very good observation. That's, that is one of the deviations from uh, converted entirely static. There are some minor exceptions. Um, 
All right, so going back to uh, the lowering, I'm not going to describe the entire process because it's fairly straightforward. I think um, an example would, uh, would suffice. For instance, here, notice that the break statement was, was replaced with a did break uh, variable. And then we have a few extra conditionals, like for instance, this one um, at the bottom, if did not break, i star equals to two to protect the, the code. And the conversions for continue and return statements are similar. All right, another important type of conversion is for function calls. We do this for all function calls. We replace them with a call to a special wrapper. This wrapper, as, it name, as its name suggests, might decide to convert the function at runtime, to convert the target function at runtime. But it may, not, it may decide not to do that. Many functions don't need to be converted. But the important part is that we replace all function calls because statically we do not know what their type is. And we do not know whether we should convert them at, uh, or not. So we defer that decision to runtime. Uh, one probably, were, uh, another mention that's probably worth making here is that from the, from the graph's perspective, functions are inline. We don't inline. We don't create any TF function. We don't create any uh, graph functions. So from this perspective, Autograph is consistent with existing uh, with B1 style graph code. What do you mean by runtime? Do you mean when TensorFlow runs it or when the Python user runs it? That's a very good question. There is more than one time, more, more than one runtime. In this case, I'm referring to the Python runtime. All right. All right. Next, the quintessential transformation. Uh, we might say, is converting control flow. So let's look at if statements first. The transformation itself is actually quite mechanical. For example, the body of the if statement becomes a new function. And we add some uh, return values to it. And we'll see more about that in a moment. And the if itself becomes a call to a special autograph overload. I'm, I'm, of course, omitting the else block here for, for the sake of brevity, but it's uh, equivalent with the main block, main body of the if statement. Once more, all the if statements are converted in this way. And here we have an example for if statement. Nothing that, uh, note that there's nothing out of the ordinary here. The body of the if becomes a body uh, in a new function. And the if statement is replaced with the, the function call. Now, loops are ever so slightly more complicated because they use state variable, but not by much. Once more, the, block, uh, the body of the loop is transformed into a new function. This time, the function has uh, arguments representing the loop variables. The conditional also becomes a function this time because it depends on the loop variables. And once more, the statement itself is replaced with a function call. Now, the more interesting question is, how do we decide which are the loop variables in your program? We could, of course, take all the variables in scope and make them loop variables, but that would be quite inefficient. <coughs> the heuristic we use uh, to do that is actually quite simple. It relies on static analysis. And in short, a, a loop variable must be both of these two conditions. First, it has to be modified inside the loop, which is quite evident. If the loop doesn't modify it, then it's invariant to it. And the second condition is that it has to be either live in or out of the loop. Now, what live means is live in means that the loop depends on the value of the variable before it entered the loop. It seems like if something is a loop condition, it would be it wouldn't have to be live into or out of the loop to be a loop variable. So is it either of these conditions? Or if it's a loop condition, then the variable would be live into the loop because it's read before anything else. I'll show an example that, uh, that uh, hopefully clarifies that a bit. The live out of the loop is similar. Uh, if the variable is used after the loop, then it's live out. So here we have an example. Um, a is, to Josh's uh, uh, remark, a is uh, both modified by, by the loop, but also live into the, the loop. Because once you enter the loop, the first thing that happens, A is being read. 
So the, variable, the value of a before the loop is definitely relevant. If a starts positive, then the loop will cycle. If a is zero, then the loop will not. So um, a is live into the loop. Um, b on the other side, on the other hand, is not modified by the loop, so we can leave that one out. And c is uh, also interesting because it is modified inside the loop, but it is not live. That's because as soon as you enter the loop, the c variable is being immediately overwritten. So the fact that it had the value 3 before the loop is completely irrelevant to the loop because that value is being destroyed uh, regardless. And this is a, a sketch of the resulting code. And I'll leave it as an exercise to verify that, that it is uh, indeed correct. Next, as I mentioned, uh, the conversion process in, is entirely static. And uh, all the statements are being converted. All the function calls are being converted. And that means that the overloads must handle any type or value verifications, uh, ver verification at runtime. Once more, at the Python runtime. Yes? So when you say modified uh, in the loop, I guess it's not only things that are assigned uh, a function within the loop can also modify variables. That's true. That's a great observation. And I will talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, in order for Autograph to com correctly convert, um, convert code, this is only when it transforms the loop into a TensorFlow loop, the side effects, such as these modifications, have to, be vi have to be visible. So if you build a function that hides that modification, that auto Autograph will not detect it. That's, a, that's an excellent observation. I'll get to that. I'll get to a specific example of that in a moment. All right. So uh, as I was mentioning, there is the, the dynamic dispatch that's handled by all uh, operators. An interesting observation here is that if we were to convert pure Python code in this way with Autograph, it would become quite slower because if every if statement will do an is instance or some type check. <coughs> so you can imagine it would be much lower than normal Python code. However, in the case of TensorFlow, for our purposes, this overhead is peanuts compared uh, when creating ops. So it doesn't really bother us in the case of, uh, of building graphs. All right. So far, when describing the process, I, uh, I ignored an important piece uh, in Python, and that is the variable scoping. So let's look at an example of, uh, of that issue with a simple conditional, which just um, increments a value in, a, in an if statement. Now, naively copying this block uh, inside a function won't work, because due to um, Python's scoping rule, x would become a variable local to the if true loop. So any modification that you make to it would be lost to the, to the Python uh, runtime. In fact, you actually get uh, an error here, because inside if true, x is a local, local variable. By incrementing it, you're trying to access an undefined variable. So the way we solved that was by renaming the variables inside the, the function body. And essentially, what we're after is avoiding to modify directly the x variable, because that's what causes Python to consider it a variable local to the, to the state, uh, to, the, to the function. Okay. Now, um, a quick note on, uh, on, muta uh, on uh, mutating variables. So this. What I just uh, showed was valid for simple variables, like x equals 1 and so on and so forth. Mutating them, like this statement where we say x dot a equals to something, that is fine, because that will not cause x or x dot a or anything to become local to the, to the function. So x still points to the correct object, so we're, and, and we're safe. safe. So uh, mutating objects, in this case, doesn't bother us. But, but like with the x of a example in there, you have the problem that because we have to execute both branches of the function, we're going to unconditionally mutate x, right? That's, that's exactly so, yes. Um, and that's exactly what I'm going uh, into with a bit more detail on these uh, mutations. As, uh, and as, as Alex alluded, you have to be careful about, uh, about the effects of tracing when uh, when running um, uh, TensorFlow statements. By you means 
we autograph, so we have to handle that case. <laughs> okay, so um, the complication, one of the complications with mutation is probably best uh, explained with this simple example. Suppose we have a method that mutates itself, it's, it, it, does, it does some changes in a loop to one of its, um, its properties, nothing uh, out of the ordinary. With a naive transformation of this loop, not doing anything is fine, it is correct if that loop was executed as a Python loop. And the effective code that executed looks kind of like this. This is not what's generated, that while loop at the bottom is actually in fact an, uh, an autograph overload, but the effective code that runs is this. So we have a loop, a loop body function, a loop count function, and there's a while loop which calls them um, as you might expect. All this works fine if it's a Python uh, loop. However, it no longer works fine if it's a TensorFlow loop. Why is that? Uh, well, I'll leave it as an exercise to think what is the value of self.a as this statement executes and after this TF while loop runs, and also what happens to the TF while loop at runtime. But I'll just go to a possible solution for this, and that is to create a temporary, uh, a special loop variable corresponding to self.a itself. And if we do this with a bit of, uh, of extra, of, of carefully handling, so that we put in self. we have self.a point to the correct value, both, both inside the body and inside the con, and after we have executed the while loop, if we do this, the TF while loop will execute correctly, and you will get the result that you would expect. The problem with that is that it breaks Python semantics, and that's something we do not want to happen. To show that, let's consider that A is not a trivial property, but it's a custom setter that you defined in your code. And let's consider that that custom setter has some side effects. For instance, it prints some messages. Now, with this equivalent code, what would happen when it ran, in, uh, it ran as a Python loop? Well, there's a lot of assignments. There are too many assignments to self.a, and that will trigger the side effects in your custom property. So you will see way too many prints in this case. And that's definitely something we do not want to happen because we want to preserve uh, Python semantics. I'm sorry, there was a question? So it seems like this transformation is just wrong, though. It shouldn't, shouldn't all the self.a be replaced with self underscore a's? That's a very good question. If we did go ahead and replace all those self.a's with self down the ray, um, then if you called any method, suppose you called a method that itself behind the scenes did some more modifications to self.a, then that method would not capture the value of self.a, right? So we have to make sure, we have to put the proper values inside self.a self because some other code might need it. All right, so the way we solve this uh, problem is to put this, uh, these uh, extra modifications into separate functions. We call them get state and set state because in a way they capture the state of the, uh, of the runtime, of the execution, of the Python execution runtime at, uh, during tracing. But what these allow us to do is they allow us to do this kind of uh, modifications in the case of, of TF while loops. And then in the case of the, in the case when we run regular Python loops, we just don't call these methods. So all the paths are, both paths are happy now. Right. Um, next, if there are no uh, additional questions, I know this is, a, this is definitely one of the trickier parts of, of autograph itself. But if there are no uh, questions, let's um, go to the second part and talk about uh, the APIs that um, users can interact with. First and foremost, the absolute recommendation is that if you can use function, just use that. It has certain advantages. It can do automatic control dependencies. There are some TensorFlow APIs that only work inside TF function. It also caches, uh, does, uh, caches the graph in addition to other things, and it has additional smarts to handle uh, exceptions. So definitely function is recommended. But if you really, really can't use TF function, you can call autograph directly 
uh, there's a specialized API. But keep in mind that it does not add automatic control dependencies, and it's also less uh, user friendly. Other APIs that you can use to tweak things include the do not convert annotation, which uh, has the obvious effect. Although even in that case, it's still preferable to, uh, to use TF function with autograph equals false. Also, if you'd like to uh, have a look at the generated code, we ha there is an uh, API for that. And as we experiment with new transformations, there is this uh, feature enumeration that you can use to enable them, to enable transformations that are not stable enough to, to release in production. Now, a few words, uh, a few notes on, uh, on debugging. By far, the best way to debug code is to run it eagerly. And there is a, tens uh, there is a function in TensorFlow that help you, helps you do that. Or you can just remove the TF function decorator, but this one lets you do it without uh, changes to the code. And that causes TF functions to run eagerly, and you can use PDB and everything else inside there. If running eagerly is not an option, then one way to peek inside what Autograph is doing is to crank up the verbosity. There is this, uh, uh, this API for that. Uh, increasing the verbosity is also useful when filing bugs. Um, there is a, a, a caution I should make. Of course, increasing the verbosity uh, ca can cause quite a, quite a bit of log spam, but it will also dump data in addition to code. It will log argument, function arguments and things like that. So please be careful when uh, sharing verbose logs. Now, if you do enable um, PDB inside autograph code using, for instance, PDB set trace, that will not crash. It will work in some way. Just remember that set trace is a function, and like every other functions, will be converted with an autograph overload. And what that means is that PDB will land somewhere inside the autograph API. At the time of this talk, you have to step out twice to get back into the generated code. And the other caveat is that, of course, you will land inside generated code. Um, OK. Now, a note on this generated code. It definitely contains lots of boilerplate. It is designed to be robust, not pretty. And ideally, in a perfect world, you should never have to, to deal with it. You should never have to see that code. And we're working uh, towards, towards achieving that. But until then, if you do end up in a situation where you have to deal with generated code, even if you see it by accident or not, or even if you have to actually uh, deal with it, please file a bug so that we can work towards avoiding that kind of exposure. All right. In the next section, I want to mention some of the semantics uh, related to autograph, because these dictate what you should and you should not expect of it. Uh, now, rather than a detail, uh, detailed explanation, I'll just list some uh, broad guiding principles. And the first such principle is that we intend auto Autograph to preserve the semantics of existing well-behaved code. By well-behaved, I mean, in general, it runs without raising an exception. So traditional pure Python code should be functionally not changed under Autograph. And the same should be valid about existing TFv1 uh, graph code. Now, to be clear, if you give such code to Autograph, it will transform it. But you should not expect its functionality, the functionality of the transformed code, to change. Then, with respect to eager code, uh, Autograph obviously supports a subset of eager. But the parts that it does support, then those should also preserve uh, functionality as they go back and uh, forth between, uh, between eager and Autograph. That means that if you have auto, uh, that um, Autograph code should not change its functionality when executed eagerly. And that essentially is what lets you remove the TF function annotation without having to uh, modify the code in any way. So at least in theory, when you remove TF function, the behavior of the code should not change. Except, yes? Does this actually happen at all, like uh, eagerly executing uh, autographed code. I, I guess I sort of assumed that we just disabled function at the same time we disabled autograph. Yes, you disabled everything. Basically, you run the code exactly as it looks. Equally. Yes. So, so like this is something that could happen. You could. Execute. You said you had a flag that turned it off. Yes, there is a flag to turn it off, or you could remove the TF function annotation. Either of those should not change the behavior of the code. So that flag still does autograph transformation. It just runs it eagerly. It doesn't do the autograph transformation anymore. OK, so there is a mode where we can do the autograph transformation and then still run it eagerly. 
There is, but not with TF function. With TF function, it's either um, running graph without a graph or running eager without autograph. But like the explicit convert API, if I ran with that. The, yes, with that one, you could potentially create some graph-like code and execute it eagerly. And that one should also preserve its functionality. But that's, uh, that's of course, in the eager semantics, right? Eager should uh, execute graph code as if uh, normally, right? But there's no reason to do that, right? It's just. No, this is just for kicks, yeah. I guess. Oh, if you want to maybe <laughs> debug an uh, issue with autograph, right? That's true, yeah. Yeah, you should. Uh, theoretically, <laughs> you should. It could, but even then, keep in mind that, um, well, there's code that runs in graph, and there's code that runs in eager. So just make sure that those two are truly really consistent, right? Yeah. All right. An implication of this guiding uh, principle is that principles is that code which does not depend on TensorFlow objects will not run as a TensorFlow statement. And that should make it hopefully easy to reason about uh, code. So let me show you an example. Of these four, uh, four statements, four loops, the one at the top is legal Python code. It doesn't uh, depend on uh, any tensors. Therefore, it will run as a Python loop. The other three will run as TensorFlow loops. Because, well, one depends on the TF range, the other one depends on the data set, the, the third one depends on um, distribution strategy. All right. In this last, sec last section, I'll go through some usage examples, which I believe are most interesting from uh, a user's perspective. Now, I will focus a bit on use cases which are illegal in Autograph, because we have lots and lots of samples of fairly complex code that works. But we have fewer examples of code that doesn't work. So here they are. OK. So I'll begin with control flow. And as a warm up, I'll show the ideal code for Autograph. This is definitely code that Autograph can handle. And it's code that we like most. And that's because it does its operations in plain sight. No hidden side effects, no hidden triggers. Um, everything is plain. Um, another example that works well is using statements like break. As we've seen, these are low words, so Autograph can deal with those um, fine as well. Now, here's an example of code that has certain limitations when running as um, a TensorFlow contr uh, control flow. So this if statement, it, can, it depends on a tensor. Therefore, it will run as a tfcon. However, notice that this x, x variable is only initialized in the in the if branch and not initialized in the else branch. And TensorFlow, as we know, does not um, have the notion of none values or undefined variables. So we cannot do, we could not do, do this in a tfcon. And instead, we raise an error. And this is actually one of the better uh, error messages that we raise, where we um, explain that you have to initialize the x in the, in the else branch. So you theory could do this by making x into an optional value. That is true, yes. And that's why I'm very excited about uh, optionals. What if x is local to that branch? What have you said? Then it's fine. Yes. If it's local, then it's fine. That's why we go through all that pain to do liveness analysis and modifications, just so that local variables don't uh, okay. trip it. OK. Now, the same restriction uh, can extend to things that you might not expect. For instance, if we have a return value that would cause the if statement to deal with an undefined value, this is also illegal. And the error message is pretty nice in this case as well. It tells you that you have to uh, return a value from the else branch as well. Uh, another example of the same limitation, uh, this time uh, dealing involving uh, object properties. <coughs> uh, in this case, the error message is a bit confusing, and we're working to, uh, to actually fix it. The error message is actually, in my opinion, it's very confusing, because it, it's, it's, a it, it's a TF con that actually would execute the else branch, but there's no else branch. So when is it trying to access A? It's definitely a confusing error. But it will be much more friendlier, hopefully soon. OK, one quick note that uh, these limitations around the none or undefined symbols can easily be avoided by initializing your variables early. So if you initialize, for instance, our uh, x at the top with some default value, then everything else would work nicely once more. So they're fairly easy to, uh, to prevent. <clears throat> 
Now, if I could be uh, pedantic for just a moment, if um, I, I would like to recommend that when you have to deal with situations where you have some default values, I definitely recommend that you have a separate variable, a separate Boolean to represent the state of not initialized or not, value, uh, not valid. I definitely recommend that over using magic values. Doing that can save you a world of pain uh, later on. And this is not strictly, it's, it's totally unrelated to autograph. It's just a, a recommendation of a good practice in general. OK, now a more significant limitation in TensorFlow control flow is around hidden side effects, as we actually had a, a question alluding to this. Um, so let's look at this example, where we have a simple helper method that mutates uh, the state of, of, uh, of self. Then there is another method that uh, calls this helper. So when converting this uh, larger method, this uh, method f, autograph static analysis, when looking at the variables for that if statement, has no way of seeing that self.a is being modified because that's hidden inside the method. And we do not uh, do cross-function analysis. Well, not yet, not yet at least. So that means that the tfcont will ultimately end up not accounting for that modification to self.a. And you get this rather obscure error message, which is uh, uh, quite confused. Once more, the error message can and hopefully will be uh, more helpful. But the limitation itself remains. Solutions are definitely possible. And I think they would make a nice, uh, nice future project. But for now, they are a, a matter of future development. Now, a good defensive against these kind of, uh, kinds of patterns is to use a more functional style in, in your code. Functional style, that means if, you, if your function modifies a value, return it. And that, uh, that helps autograph. For instance, in, uh, in this example, if we modify our code like this to return the new value, the, the new value that should be put in self.a, and then we do the assignment in plain inside the converted function, then things are happy once more and everything works. And this is my last bit of pedantry, I hope, for this, uh, for this talk. In general, functional style tends to be loved by, uh, by machines. Compilers and static analysis and analyzers have a much easier time dealing with functional code, code that takes its inputs as arguments and returns everything that, that's modified. And sometimes it could, make, uh, it could help the code become more readable, too. All right. Uh, next up, a few examples around uh, data sets, which are quite, uh, quite satisfying, in my opinion because it shows that the underlying TF data and distribution strategy APIs are powerful enough to facilitate uh, these kinds of, uh, of conversions. So the first example is that iterators, the TF data iterators, work in almost all cases. And we'll see the few exceptions uh, in a second. But essentially, you can take the iterator, you can uh, go through parts of it, and then you can break out of the loop, and then you can resume it, and everything works as you would expect. And if you're curious, the implementations for for loops using uh, TF data iterators and data sets are actually, they might actually be quite, uh, they're quite an interesting read. I think they're quite a nice uh, fit. The code uh, with all those callbacks might be difficult to, to follow, but in my opinion, it's quite interesting. And you can find it in the, in the specialized um, control for operators of, of autograph. Especially for data sets, we actually, to handle a for loop, we end up applying three operations in sequence. Scan, take while, and reduce. And I think that's, um, that's pretty, pretty nice. All right. Uh, consuming an iterator with the next uh, function also works. And just to be clear, this is code that runs as graph code. All right. Next, let's talk about handling runtime exceptions. And since we were just talking about iterators, let's talk about a common pattern in Python. It's generally considered Pythonic, um, uh, such a pattern, where you just try things and catch an exception if they don't work. So instead of, of having a pattern where you say, if I can do foo, do foo, this pattern is do foo, try dofu except can't do it. 
and one of the most common uses of such a, a pattern is the use of iterators, where you have a, a loop, and inside the try except block, you just try to call next. Now, for, for pure Python control flow under autograph, this works just fine. It works the way you would, uh, you would expect. Unfortunately, that doesn't work for TensorFlow um, control flow. And that's because, well, it's a dual reason. One of them is that there is no exception catching in graph mode. There is no op that catches uh, TensorFlow runtime exceptions. Now, on the other hand, we, you could conceive that autograph could lower exceptions. I mean, we lower return statements, therefore, we should be able to lower exceptions as well. However, that could make the code prohibitively complex and slow, for instance, because any statement could conceivably raise an exception. You would have to wrap each line with an if statement. So the lowering would not look uh, um, very pretty, at least not in the trivial case. OK, so the implication of this means that um, if you have a TensorFlow uh, control flow statement and you wrap, wrap a next call into such a try except block, Autograph will not complain about it. It will, it will leave the try except into the code. It will not transform it. But if you think about it, the effective code will completely ignore it. The runtime TensorFlow exception, since there is no caching inside the graph, any runtime error will bubble uh, all the way through the, through the um, TensorFlow runtime. So essentially, what this means is that if you put a try except inside graph code, the exception will not be caught. It will just fly past the except statement. Um, it also means that if you do end up trying to catch exceptions, you should do that in eager mode, outside of the TF function. Because in eager mode, you can cache them, right? The runtime exception bubbles through the TensorFlow runtime, and then it's captured by TF function and re-raised as a, as a Python exception. So you can catch it, just not inside the graph. Should we add uh, try catch op to TensorFlow? I would love that. <laughs> I don't know what the implications about the optimization and XLA are. I think it's, it's a little scary because of the unknown semantics of what ops could be running in parallel at the same time. And if only one of them generates an error, it's, a, it's also we do those get, the other ones get canceled or what? That's true. We can't actually use actual exceptions to implement this because mm. we are building without. Well, we wouldn't use C++ exceptions. Right. It would have to be a, a new. TensorFlow yeah. runtime language feature. Exception that's tensor. That's right. I mean, you could have an op that takes three function depths and calls one, calls another the first one raises an exception, and then always calls the third one to so like simulate the behavior of try catch finally. Uh, that would have the consequence that Josh pointed out that the cancellation in TensorFlow is very non-deterministic about what actually gets executed in the presence of an error. But yeah. Um, it's a separate discussion. I just wanted to bring it up. We've definitely started the hornet's nest with this. <laughs> yes. So a question about the previous slides. How can you tell whether a loop is a TensorFlow iterator and whether a loop is just a Python? Ah, that's an, uh, <clears throat> that's an excellent question. In this particular case, I'm just implying that stop condition returns a tensor. In general, we look at the condition of the loop. If the condition object is a tensor, then it, it will be a TF while loop. If it's a Python Boolean or whatnot, then it will be a plain Python loop and it will be unrolled. Does this answer your question? All right. OK, so um, going past uh, adding a TF um, ex catch exception to TensorFlow. Now, there is a bit of a, of, uh, there, is, there are good news about this. It, that is that, um, <coughs> In most of the code, you can avoid having to catch exceptions altogether. For instance, with data sets, you can transpose the computation a bit. And instead of having a while loop, you can have a for loop over the data set. And that will make sure that the loop stops when the data set is exhausted. And then you move the condition inside the if statement, because we do support break statements. So these two pieces of code, the one in the right and the one in the left, are functionally equivalent. 
And if you squint, I think it's actually even shorter. So I might, if I dare say, it's actually cleaner. <coughs> All right. Uh, next up, let's discuss a bit about collections. Uh, so again, in normal pure Python code, uh, this uh, code, this snippet is, as you probably expect, it's it's very common where you just take a list and operate on it. That's we do that in Python a lot, right? And as with any other pure Python code, this works just fine under autograph. But if the loop is a, ten uh, is a TensorFlow loop, things don't work anymore. And once more, you get a rather obscure error message that we will hopefully fo fix soon. Um, but in general, the loop is that you cannot operate on a Python collection from TensorFlow control flow. That just doesn't align with, with things. And it's not uh, not supported by autograph. Instead, um, it's a good practice to use specialized TensorFlow collections, like for instance TensorArray, and it's a good idea to do it even when you work in eager mode, because that would mean that you don't have to modify the code if you want if you ever want to go to to, to autograph. Wait, so you, you don't want to do that transformation yourself to switch it to a TensorArray? The problem with that transformation is that it's difficult to do. It's sort of retroactive. Mm. The main problem, uh, if we look at this uh, back slide, there is this L being initialized with an empty Python list. First and foremost, we don't know the type of that list. And we don't know, uh, at this line, it's unclear whether the user even wanted a Python list or a TensorFlow list. So we'd be forced to make assumptions that would violate the semantics of, of normal Python code. It's definitely, definitely a challenge. That's why we, we resorted to the rule that, OK, if you want a TensorFlow list, please be explicit about this. And we'll, we'll offer as much syntactic sugar around that as possible, but you have to explicitly request it. All right. Uh, let's see a few other examples that, uh, that need special attention, this time around uh, loops that change the type or, uh, uh, or shape of their variables. So first off, a probably familiar example of a type uh, TensorFlow while loop, which you probably are already aware that uh, TensorFlow limits the degrees to which uh, tensors can change shapes or D types inside the loop itself. And you typically get error messages of this kind, that some tensor enters the loop with a shape and has a different shape after one, iterations, one iteration. Now, there are uh, ways to deal with this, one of which is specifying shape invariance for the loop. And we're working to add support for, for that in Autograph as well, with a special uh, function call that lets you uh, specify them. Another thing that we're working to address is making the error message more useful as well. For example, here, it would be nicer if the error message was saying something about the variable a rather than some obscure uh, const zero. Right. A more subtle effect of changing types in a loop is shown here. This variable a starts as a plain Python value, and then inside the loop, it becomes a tensor. Now, according to Autograph's dispatch loop, when we first execute the loop, when we execute the first iteration, it would appear that it's a Python loop, because a is a Python scalar, scalar therefore Python loop. But after the first iteration, it would appear that the loop is, in fact, a um, TensorFlow loop. So we're working to improve the error message uh, here as well, to uh, be explicit that that happens. But in the future, we hope to actually just deal with that directly. So for instance, you can envision that we could uh, cycle through the loop a couple of times, and if we decide that um, it should, uh, that the Python loop should become a TensorFlow loop, we should just do that. And then we would only have a few unrolled iterations before the loop. All right, now going back to, to exceptions and to errors, um, let me show you a few examples of how Autograph modifies them so that they don't point to generated code. Now first, graph construction errors are being modified by expanding their error message. And that is purely the, the error message itself. We don't, um, we don't touch the traceback of that error. That will still point to generated code. However, the error message has this stack trace like message that helps you locate the cause of the error in the original source code. 
And this is, uh, if you think about it, this is very similar to the way uh, TensorFlow runtime errors have a second stack trace uh, showing you the location of, the, of where the app was created. Um, now, with this, um, this augmentation of the error message is done using a mechanism that wraps the original exception into a new one. And unfortunately, we don't have time uh, today to, uh, to discuss uh, a lot of details about how it's done. Um, but what's important to mention is that most of the time, the type of the error does not change. So if you raise a value, if, if the TensorFlow runtime, sorry, if, the, if your app raises a value error, then the users will see a value error as well. It's just that its message will be changed. However, sometimes when we cannot um, replace errors using the same type, you might see staging error instead. And that typically handle, uh, happens when you have constructors that are complex and we cannot, uh, which we ca and we cannot uh, figure out how to call the construction, the, the call the constructor in a way that keeps the, keeps the data. Most errors just have a, a simple init constructor with just a string message. And there we can just create a new error of the same type with a, um, an expanded message. But where we can't do that, you will see this uh, staging error. The original type of the exception can still be recovered, so you can still um, inspect the exception to find the my special exception type and its original message and so forth. Okay, now uh, lastly, runtime errors are modified in a similar fashion so that they don't point to, to generated code. In this case, we simply, the, the, the error message is not actually changed from what was originally raised. We just simply replace the references. So here, you will see, I ran this code in uh, IPython and you see, that's why you see this IPython input. That's the reference to the cell. What's important is that you don't see a reference to some temporary uh, file that contains generated code. All right. Now, once more, uh, I probably repeated that uh, quite a bit in the talk. We try as much as possible to remove the references uh, to generated code from error messages. If you do see any messages or any, um, where that's still not the case, uh, please do file a bug. Okay, one last example that I want to show is how decorators are uh, handled. And in general, in Python, decorators are just syntactic sugar. They are just high order functions that get executed when the code is loaded. Um, from many perspectives, that's, uh, that's why decorators are actually difficult to detect because they, they're not materialized in the AST. At least most of the time, they're not. Anyway, when you convert decorated functions with autograph, the decorator will be converted. And that's the reason why um, you will usually see the source code of the wrapper. For instance, if you have this decorator that just replaces the function with a wrapper, and you try to convert, um, if you, uh, you try to convert the decorated function, you will see the source code of the wrapper instead. That should be no cause for alarm because the recursive conversion will end up will step into into the wrapper and convert the target function as well. So things do work as as expected. All right, that's it. What I uh, that's it for now. That's all I had for today. There are a lot of other topics that I didn't cover for uh, lack of time, um, and I hope these and many other examples would be discussed in a more uh, in more detail in um, more comprehensive reference guide that is in currently in the works. And that's it. Thank you very much.